Greetings, my fellow explorers of the cosmos. I'm May Thobol, your guide through the hidden truths of frontier science, where equations whisper secrets and reality wears a disguise. Welcome back to the blog where physics meets philosophy, and wonder isn't just encouraged, it's required. Imagine a world where objects can be in two places at once, not for a split second, but for hours. Where the line between the quantum and the real blurs, and a tiny glass bead dances with itself like a ghost in a laser beam. In this mind-bending journey, we explore persistent quantum superposition, the revolutionary breakthrough that's shattering old limits. So buckle up, truth seekers, because today we're stepping into a multiverse of possibilities where every quantum event spawns a new you. To help us navigate this labyrinth of wave functions and parallel selves, I brought in my brilliant co-pilot, Brian. Grab your coffee, silence your inner skeptic, and prepare to have your perception of reality gently rewritten. Brian, the floor is yours. Thanks, May. I'll do my best to guide us through this thought-provoking topic. Let's explore the dreamscape together. Imagine, if you will, a grand concert hall suspended in the velvet void of space where the instruments are not made of wood or brass, but of probability and possibility. The violinist draws her bow across strings that are not there, and yet the note blooms, clear, shimmering, impossible. It is not a single tone, but all tones at once, vibrating in harmony with themselves. This is the music of quantum superposition, a melody so strange, so delicate, that for a century we dared not believe it was real. We have long been taught that things are here or there, alive or dead, spinning up or down. But the universe, it turns out, has a taste for paradox. It delights in ambiguity. And nowhere is this more evident than in the phenomenon of quantum superposition, the uncanny ability of a particle or even an object to exist in multiple states at the same time, like a dancer caught mid-pirouette, neither beginning nor end, but all moments fused into one eternal spin. And now, in a twist that would make even Schrodinger spill his tea, physicists have done the unthinkable. They've made this ghostly dance last, not for a fleeting picosecond, not in the frozen silence of near absolute zero, but in the warm, messy world we inhabit. They've created persistent quantum objects, macroscopic things that hum with quantum life, existing in two places at once, not as a fleeting dream, but as a sustained reality. It's as if the universe has decided to stay slightly out of focus just to keep us guessing. Let us begin, as all quantum tales must, with the infamous cat. Poor Schrodinger never meant for his feline thought experiment to become the mascot of quantum absurdity. He devised it as a reductio ad absurdum, a sarcastic jab at the Copenhagen interpretation. Surely, he argued, a cat cannot be both dead and alive. That's madness. And yet, here we are, decades later, peering into the box with a mix of dread and fascination, wondering not whether the cat is alive, but whether the universe itself is playing a cosmic game of hide-and-seek. For superposition is not about cats or boxes, it is about the very fabric of being. It's the idea that until a system is observed, measured or entangled with the wider world, it does not choose. It floats, suspended in a cloud of maybes. Think of a coin spinning in the air. While it whirls, it is neither heads nor tails, but a blur of both. Only when it lands, plink, does it declare its allegiance. In the quantum realm, this spinning coin is not just a metaphor. An electron, for instance, doesn't have a definite position until you look. It exists in a superposition of all possible locations, like a whisper echoing through every room of a house at once. And when you finally open the door to one room, the whisper collapses. Suddenly it was there all along. But here's the rub. The moment you interact with the system, when the Geiger counter clicks, the poison vial shatters, the cat sneezes, the superposition vanishes. This is decoherence, the universe's way of tidying up its mess. Interactions with the environment, air molecules, stray photons, even the faint hum of cosmic background radiation act like tiny observers, forcing quantum possibilities to collapse into classical certainty, which is why, until recently, superposition was the shy guest at the party, only seen in isolated, ultra-cold, perfectly shielded systems. You couldn't find it in your coffee, your cat or your car. It was the privilege of electrons and atoms, not elephants. But science, 
like a mischievous child, loves to break rules. And so, in a series of breathtaking experiments, physicists have done the forbidden. They've made large objects visible to the naked eye exist in superposition at room temperature, and not for a fleeting instant, but for hours, even days. These are the persistent quantum objects, and they are rewriting the textbooks. Imagine a tiny glass bead, no larger than a speck of dust, levitated in a beam of laser light. It hovers, pristine, isolated from the chaos of the world. Now nudge it, just so, and quantum magic takes hold. The bead doesn't just move, it moves and doesn't move. It exists in two positions at once, like a ghost haunting two rooms. And thanks to ingenious materials and shielding, it stays that way. The decoherence that once shattered superposition like glass in a thunderstorm is now held at bay. The quantum state persists. This is not science fiction, it is not philosophy. It is data. Scientists have achieved this with molecules of fullerene soccer ball shaped clusters of dozens of carbon atoms watching them produce interference patterns like waves even as they radiate heat like tiny suns these are not elementary particles they are complex classical seeming objects and yet they dance the quantum waltz the implications are intoxicating if we can maintain superposition in large objects we can build quantum computers that don't need to be frozen to a billionth of a degree we can create sensors so precise they could detect the gravitational pull of a single virus. We might even one day teleport a virus or a diamond. Or if we're feeling particularly ambitious, a cat. To understand superposition, think of music. When a violin plays a note, it isn't just one frequency vibrating in the air. It is a symphony of harmonics, overtones that blend together to give the sound its richness. The total sound is a superposition of all these frequencies, layered like translucent sheets of light. In quantum mechanics, the notes are called basis states. For a quantum bit, the famous qubit, the notes are vertical bar 0 and vertical bar 1. But unlike a classical bit, which must be one or the other, a qubit can be both at once. A delicate blend, a chord of possibility, it is vertical bar 0 and vertical bar one, with varying degrees of each, like a voice humming two pitches simultaneously. And just as the richness of a musical chord comes from the interference of its tones, the power of quantum computing comes from the interference of its states. When qubits interact, their superpositions weave together, creating a tapestry of computation so vast that even the fastest classical computer could never unravel it. A machine with just 300 perfectly coherent qubits could represent more states than there are atoms in the observable universe. That is not an exaggeration, that is arithmetic. Spun into poetry. Now a question slithers in, cold and persistent. What counts as an observation? Does the universe require a conscious mind to collapse a superposition? Must there be a human, a cat, a camera? The answer, it turns out, is far more unsettling. Everything is watching everything else. The moment a quantum system interacts with anything, a photon, a molecule, a stray cosmic ray, it begins to leak information into the environment. This is decoherence in action, not a sudden collapse, but a slow, inevitable entanglement with the world. Imagine throwing a pebble into a still pond. At first, the ripples are pure, circular, beautiful, but as they spread, they hit leaves, twigs, the shore. The pattern becomes messy, chaotic. You can no longer tell where the pebble fell. In the same way, a quantum superposition spreads into the environment, entangling with trillions of particles, the which path information is still there in principle, but it's scattered across the cosmos, like a book torn into confetti and scattered by the wind. So no, you don't need a human to collapse a wave function. The cosmic microwave background, the afterglow of the Big Bang, bathes the Earth in photons. They bounce off the moon, off your coffee cup, off Schrodinger's cat. They are always measuring the moon is there when no one looks, not because of consciousness, but because it is constantly being observed by the universe itself. And so we return to the persistent quantum object, not just as a marvel of engineering, but as a philosophical earthquake. For if large objects can remain in superposition, then the boundary between the quantum and classical worlds is not a wall, but a fog. There is no size limit at which quantum weirdness stops. There is only isolation. You are not in superposition, not because you are too big, but because you are too connected. Every breath you take, every photon that touches your skin, ties you more tightly to the web of reality. You are constantly being measured, collapsed.
classicalized, but in principle, in principle, you could be placed in superposition. If we could isolate you from all interactions and survive the attempt, you could, like the fullerene, exist in two places at once. The universe does not forbid it, only decoherence does, and now with persistent quantum objects, we are learning to tame decoherence. We are building shields against the gaze of the cosmos. This leads to a staggering thought. Perhaps all matter is always in superposition and what we call reality is just the tip of a vast submerged iceberg of possibilities. The chair you're sitting on, it's vibrating in a superposition of trillions of states. Your thoughts, they may emerge from quantum processes in the brain, dancing on the edge of coherence. The future, not fixed, but a branching tree of superposed outcomes collapsing only as it becomes the past. So what are persistent quantum objects, if not miracles, dressed in equations? They are proof that the universe is stranger, more generous, more playful than we ever dared hope. They are bridges between the ghostly quantum realm and our solid, sensible world. They whisper that reality is not a static sculpture, but a dance. One that never truly ends, only changes partners and superposition, it is the music of that dance, the harmony of contradictions, the note that is both C and D, the cat that sleeps and wakes, the object that is here and also there and also everywhere in between. We once thought the universe was made of tiny billiard balls bouncing predictably through space. Now we know it is made of possibility woven into the fabric of existence. And every time we create a persistent quantum object, we are not just building a device, we are composing a sonnet in the language of the cosmos. So the next time you see a dust moat floating in a sunbeam, pause. That speck of nothing might, in another layer of reality, be dancing with itself. And somewhere in a lab humming with lasers and dreams, a tiny object is existing in two places at once. Forever, or at least until someone looks, the universe is still spinning its coin and it has not landed yet. And there you have it, my lovers of the labyrinth. Remember, every challenge is just a stepping stone to greatness. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe so we can keep exploring together, and drop a comment to share your thoughts. Until next time, stay curious, stay bold, and keep chasing those dreams.